I am Yusu Collins and I'm joined by Amazing today and we're going to go through everything that happened at the playoffs of the LCS lock-in. Team Liquid became the first ever LCS team to win the lock-in after beating Cloud9 in five maps, taking home a grand prize of $150 thousand dollars and showing why they are one of the best teams in the region core jj going right back in dredge line finds an opponent and look at that blabber you got to get the hell out of town buddy but there's no way out they blocked the roads vulcan's dead next tactical taking the kill team liquid taking the fight team liquid taking the game everybody's rooted up and beat down perks is your last man standing team liquid the best team in North America still, and the winners of your first ever LCS lock-in. Before we dive deeper into the finals, I have to talk about TSM and FlyQuest because these were the two teams that coming into this tournament were considered two of the best because of how they did last, um, last year in their region. They went to Worlds, but neither of these teams actually got past the quarterfinal stage. So amazing. If we start with TSM, what did you make of their tournament? What went right for them? And I guess what went wrong? I mean, there's a short list about what went right for them because I don't quite know what went right for them. <laughs> I felt like Lost performed pretty well, I guess. Um, he, had his, he had a couple of games where he actually popped off and actually seemed pretty comfortable in his spot. But the rest of the team really feels disenergetic. Like, there seems to be no instance where they're all on the same page. And it may be, and that's what I'm fearing right now, that this is due to roster construction. Um, I talked about this in the early episode, that we kind of had this, like, talk about, hey, they're not really fitting together. I don't know if they can anymore. I don't want to sound alarm bells because it's only the first tournament of the season. Uh, but they seem, they seem to be on so many different pages because everyone is reading something else. Huni is really aggressive at certain times, uh, but all forces. Sword Art is really aggressive at certain times, uh, but usually towards the bot side of the map, so he doesn't really uh, create plays for, with Huni. And these two people should at least be on the same page, but then they're not. So there's nothing that I can see going for them right now. And I also don't think that the players that they've chosen, at least in terms of, I think, Huni especially, is the kind of caliber player that is actually going to carry them to... Uh, a championship or words, whatever their aspirations may be. Oof. Were you surprised then that they kind of bombed out as early as they did? Because I think most people probably would have liked to see them at least uh, at the, in the semi-finals, if not in the finals. I mean, they they just ran into Cloud9, and I think that's what made them uh, not get to semi-finals. I think they would have probably beaten... Now, actually, I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even sure who they would have beaten, because EG is supposed to be better. Um, Cloud9 is supposed to be better. Obviously, Team Liquid is supposed to be better, so... Uh, the only other uh, semi-finalists would have been one of these, and they were on the roll. So it's pretty tough to see them taking a series right now in a five-game series. I can see them best taking best of ones, but not a five-game series over any of the, those teams right now. Mm. I know you said that you don't see this as a championship team, but you know, at the end of the day, if you make it to playoffs, uh, anything can happen. We've seen teams that aren't necessarily uh, teams that you expect to go to Worlds, but they have a great showing at playoffs. They have a little bit of luck. And then the next thing we know, they're going to Worlds. Uh, do you maybe see this potentially be the only way that this team can make it there? I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, there's definitely potential that they can also like just get, get an upswing. Suddenly all the pieces fit together. Um, it's just like that the potential, uh, like it, it, it's really tough to see it like at a, at a high percentage. I don't see it as like an 80, 20 kind of thing. I see it as a 20, 80 kind of probability where, uh, they're going to make it and they all going to fit together and suddenly it's going to work. Um, simply because all the other rosters, at least like the top tier rosters seem to be constructed a tad better than TSM is. And I think of Team Liquid, obviously, Afari is perfect fit for them. Centaurin is a perfect fit for them because they play this slow and controlled style while still having the mechanical ability to play somewhat upbeat. Um, and the same for one of these that seem to be like kind of on the upswing. Same for EG, but are really aggressive overall. And then Cloud9 is maybe the only other team where I can see some of the issues, but they have so much individual talent that they actually outshine TSM, I would say, due to perks mainly and uh, due to the fact that they um, have this mechanical upside through Blaba and uh, potentially Fudge. Mm, well, now what about FlyQuest? Because I think maybe it's uh, a little bit more fair to manage expectations with FlyQuest yeah. just because even though they did super well last year, um, there were you know a little bit of cracks here and there. And of course, they made some massive roster changes. And it's maybe a bit unfair to look at this current team as the same team that was last year because it just isn't. 
Yeah, it isn't. I think what they've done with the roster is actually something I really admire because all of their players seem to have this wholesome attitude to a certain extent. I think Licorice is a good fit. Um, I think Jose Dedo is obviously a good fit. Um, and I think overall they seem to kind of embrace that they they are in a rebuild, that they mm. will not necessarily win this year, but they're still brought in pieces that could potentially lead them to playoffs. So um, I would expect them to be a 7th, 8th place team, realistically speaking right now. Um, but they could definitely like lock in the playoff spot with the sixth seed. So it's 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 what it is, you know. The uh, it's a it's a um, slightly out of reach playoff team, and they're gonna manage that as it is, and they're gonna look forward to next year. I would suppose when they actually like have this rebuild coming in, and then obviously have a year of development, and then suddenly have like a year of experience behind them. I feel like that's what they were last year as well, <laughs> but they kind of sped up that process and and really uh, saw some consistency towards the end. But going into the regular split, which does start in four days time, so there's not much time to fix too many things. So if you were TSM and FlyQuest right now, um, if we go through both of the teams individually, what's the one thing that you would prioritize on fixing before the split starts? For TSM, it's definitely just make just give give the team a single voice someone who's going to operate the entire team and have this guy be the leader like select someone make this guy that guy and then streamline the whole entire thing i think it's a lot it's going to be a lot easier because it feels like that they have too many voices mm. um or they just have too many different play sets and both of these both of these okay i can't speak english anymore both of these things are actually fixed by the fact that um like if you streamline it through one voice you suddenly don't have like that kind of disparity in play sets anymore. You actually have a streamline, you do the same thing, and then you figure out, hey, was this good for everyone? Everyone, was this good for someone? And then you kind of figure it out through that, and then the shortcut can adapt. So I think that will maybe help them. Mm. And so FlyQuest, honestly, just take more time with Jose Deodo. Like that's what it is. When he came in, uh, especially the Olaf game, um, he definitely did his, did his part. And I think that's something they can look forward to because he has the mechanical ability. And just develop the pieces, take some time. I don't think there's anything they can fix because they don't need any fixing. Mm. Well, we talked about Evil Geniuses as well in the mid-tournament review show, and you were quite impressed with how they were performing at the time. Uh, of course, they couldn't really get past TL. It was a 3-0 in the end in the semifinals. Uh, but what did you like and, and I guess didn't like about their performance? I mean, what I liked is that I mean, we talked about the streamline thing for TSM. I think they have this going for them. I think their entire team is constructed in a similar manner. I think the only odd piece out would maybe be uh, definitely to a certain extent, because I didn't see him as such an aggressive player, but he seems to really put up with what you know is thrown out. So um, I think overall, um, they understand the map, they understand macro, but they still understand how to make certain plays at certain times and look for the individual outplay. So they're not that far uh, away from from the top teams, which, in my opinion, is still Team Liquid. It's still Cloud9. Um, but overall, and that's, I guess, what I didn't like and what I don't like is that they have an issue with, with the mid lane pool. And mm. I think Shizuke has always been a player that has been really specific in the champions. And that's good for a certain amount of time until people figure him out. So he's going to surprise people, especially new mid laners with his pool, Rise, Echo, um, but then at some point he's going to fall flat because people are going to figure out counter picks and they're going to have enough practice against him. So that's what I'm not looking forward to because I do think that would make EG a lot weaker than they are and they will actually fall behind like even the likes of um, potentially TSM and one of these. Mm, yeah, you know, they lost to Team Liquid, which um, is not like the end of the world to lose to the team that wins the tournament. I feel like that's like a comforting thing that they can yeah. tell themselves. Uh, and speaking of Team Liquid, you had a lot of faith in them, I think, from the start. Uh, it was very much like meta dependent, I think, from what you said, whether they can make it all the way or not. Um, but before we dive too deep into them, I just wanted to single out Alfari because he is someone I believe would have had a starting uh, position in the LEC if he wanted to stay. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, maybe even now, aren't a fully understanding of why he decided to leave. But how impressed uh, were you with his performance? And do you think he has the potential to become one of the best um, top laners in that region? I mean, he's already one of the best top laners in the region. I don't think there's anyone besides him, Licorice and Fudge that can kind of compete for that spot and impact, obviously. So you have four players. 
Uh, I think Sunday is a bit too individualistic, even though he's really, really good. So maybe like the, he's kind of like Sunday. Sunday and Afari kind of have the same issues, just in different regions. Afari had the same issue in EU, where he was too individualistic and he couldn't quite fit into a team environment. And Sunday kind of has the same issue in A. In a. So because his play style is like slightly away from what the region demands. And I think Afari is a perfect fit. I think he'd have had, a, as you said, like a starting position in most of the LEC rosters, maybe besides G2 and maybe besides Fnatic, but. Um, yeah, I'm impressed with him simply because he seems to actually really be catered to. And I think um, they understand finally, like, or his team understands how to utilize him, uh, un much unlike Origin, because Origin could not utilize him at all, where they didn't use his lane powers, they didn't use his slow pushes, they didn't use his lane control, which is his big strength, right? Like, his lane control is probably the best in the league, and it's probably the best in the Western region. So, um if you utilize that properly and you understand his lane mecha me mechanisms, you can actually make him a great, great player. And I think TL is doing it perfectly, so he will shine continuously. Mm. Well, on the opposite side of the map, you know, uh, bot lane. I can't believe we're talking about Core JJ again in 2021, but this guy uh, is just good. <laughs> There's just not even that many words you can describe him because we always have to talk about core jj whether it's even in the lcs or on the world stage i feel like he always does everything he's supposed to do and he does them well um so how instrumental do you think he is to this tl team especially going into the regular split i mean he has to be superman continuously and i think that's what it's what it takes to win the championship because if this guy slacks off i think the team is going to be a lot worse because he's one of the few sources of actual playmaking within the team. If you think about Centaurian, obviously he has the mechanical ability to make things happen, but he's more of a, okay, I'm adhering to the game's kind of standard. You know, like, there's a slow push top, I'm going to go there. There's a slow push on the bottom, I'm going to go there. But he's not necessarily in, in like, a self-made who's going to make something happen out of nothing. So oh. the same thing for Jensen, the same thing for Afari, and Tactical is a bit, like, obviously adhering to quarter day. So... Kotete is kind of the Ignar for his team, where he has to like start certain place and make something happen if nothing is happening, um, while maintaining a high shot calling proficiency. So um, this guy, if he if he keeps this up, I don't see any way right now, uh, besides Cloud9, like for any other other teams to actually um, overtake them, because they just don't have the shot calling ability that Kotete possesses, nor do they have the mechanical ability through the support role, which is a really important role in 2021. Uh, in Core J, like they just don't have it. No one has the stability that Core J has to make plays out of nothing. Mm. Like I said, it's 2021. Um, I just feel like we, we would have had another player, maybe in NA or maybe in that position that would kind of come close to what Core J brings to this team. Um, is there anyone that you feel like comes to you immediately for the rest of the scene, support wise, that is at least trying to emulate what Core JJ does? Because surely if you are a support player on another team and you look at what he's doing and how he's doing it, you would be sitting there, uh, not necessarily studying, but at least wanting to have the sim same impact that he brings. I mean, Ignar is probably a close, close one. I think Ignar has some of the abilities. I think he's like, Core JJ is like the best of both worlds, right? You have the mechanical ability and you have the shot calling ability. I think Ignar is is little less on a, on a shot calling ability, but more so on the playmaking ability. So I think his priorities are just weighed, weighed, weighed differently. So I think Ignar could come close. And I think obviously Sword Art, if we think about him, mm. uh, this guy is a word finalist. So I would assume that he has like some kind of ability in that regard. It just depends on how much it translates to the team. And I think that's what it, we'll see over the course of the season. Uh, that Sword Art um, will probably st yeah, stack up pretty well against uh, Quadra Day at some point. But obviously, it will take a bit more time for the roster to gen them to actually understand what they have to do together in order to be on the same page. Mm. Well, of course, the final win to five maps. We always love a best of five that goes all the way. Um, you know, it was very nearly a reverse sweep. How did you think that Cloud9 managed to get back into the game? And do you see a world where they should have or could have closed out that series? They should have never won because they were clearly the worst team. That being said, I think the way that they clawed themselves back in uh, was actually um, creating hope for a lot of people. Because Fudge, in the first two games, he was outmatched. Like, it's it's really simple. And so there's no shame in that. And I think people have to take the shame out of that. Because if you get outperformed by someone that's, that's, get, 
that gets paid a million is bringing ball over from Europe that has had experience on the world stage, has been experienced for four years now. He's played since 2017 in the pro scene. He, there's no shame in that. It is what it is. Um, but game three and four really gave me hope that I finally saw, or like I saw some of the things that po- probably Cloud9 saw in him, like this mechanical ability. But even in, I guess, in game one and two, you had that come sprinkles of, of this uh, mechanical excellence that I think Fudge possesses. Um, if I think about the Camille plays, and I think about the earlier plays later on in the series, obviously game five was kind of like, eh, not, not so good. But um, this guy has the talent to compete at the highest level. The only thing he has to now put in is the brains with the bronze. And I think that's the last step that t- it takes for him. And that's something a rookie would always learn if he's willing to over the course of multiple LCS splits or LEC splits. It just takes time. He has to learn from his teammates. He has to understand the uh, the pace of the game and he has to understand the pace of the lane. And I think that's what it takes. Um, and I, I'm confident with perks around him, with Mithy around him, because I know these people and I know Sven with them around, with all of them around him, that he's going to manage to do so at some point. Um, and I do expect it to be there by the end of the split, honestly. Mm. Well, a lot of people still do very much feel like this team is a, a serious contender or at least have the potential to be a serious contender. Um, wh- what do you think? And do you think that even though they didn't manage to win this tournament, it doesn't really matter that much to them going forward? It's actually good that they lost it because I know how salty Mithy gets. I know how salty Perks get when they lose something. Like Perks is maybe the most driven person we've seen in League of Legends uh, history in the Western region, at least. Besides, maybe I, I honestly no, I would actually put him there because this guy, every time he loses, he literally feels it with with his entire body. Like after the finals of 2019, he he sobbed like like a uh, he sobbed for 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 ages actually after the finals. And then when I saw him in 2018, after he lost to Fnatic, when his team was clearly just worse because they were not put up to the task with Jan and Wadid at the time. Um, he was also just, also just sobbing. I think that emotional response to losing is something that's so dearly missed, and he has it. And he knows that, the, like, and he, in a sense, it actually drives him. And he's continuing to actually feel the kind of emotions that people should not feel after four or five years of playing in the same region. It just doesn't happen that often. Um, and I think that guy, he has it in him. So them losing is really good because he will now drive his team to be the other best. So. Uh, I, I do expect it to be the same spring finance, honestly. Like, it's going to be TL against Cloud9, bar a huge surprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, looking back on the lock in as a whole, so group stage and playoffs, who would you pick as your, uh, I guess, early preseason MVP? Quarter Jane. Um, him, definitely. I don't think there's anyone else that performed to the same level besides potentially Suntorin. When he came in, he won. Uh, I mean, he won the first six games, first eight games, actually, if I remember correctly, and then lost two and then won another. Until Santorin came in for Team, team Liquid, they were not quite on that level. So I think Santorin and Kodje are probably the two ones I would, I would put forward. Um, and maybe on one of these, I think Damonte performed exceptionally. Um, he's always been criticized, kind of like... I mean, he's not really see, not criticized, but he's not seen in the upper echelon of midlanders. Despite him performing well against every mid laner that I've seen so far, he doesn't really have bad games. He didn't have bad games against Cloud9. He didn't have bad games even last year uh, against most of the mid laners. Like, he just doesn't perform badly. He is always up to the task. And I think Damonte, as a corner, like, as a centerpiece, honestly, for the one he's also has been a really good pickup so far. And I'm excited to see what he's going to do forward. Mm, well, looking ahead, uh, lastly, to the regular split, which team are you most excited for and why? I mean, it doesn't even necessarily have to be the team you think is going to win it. <laughs> most excited for? Um, I would say one out of these because I want to see them evolve. And I think, obviously, with my time spent there, I know how they operate. And I know that they're willing to do whatever it takes that the Ross is going to be good. Um and that makes me hopeful for the future because they've already been performing so well. They've already made the investment of bringing in as good of players as they could at the very time with a lot of synergy. So the plan for this year, and I said this in an earlier episode too, that I think it's really good. And bringing in Damonte as a centerpiece, as a roaming mid laner who's really aggressive, who's always trying to make plays for Sunday, will actually create that very thing that they look they were looking for, which is that mid jungle top synergy. So 
my thesis. I think I'm more successful with them, yeah. Brilliant. And uh, there you have it, everyone. That's about all the time we have for today. Congratulations once again to Team Liquid and thank you, amazing as always, for joining me. Uh, make sure to drop this video a like if you've enjoyed it and subscribe for more League of Legends content.